Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The Institute is a federally funded research and development center operated by Carnegie Mellon University and sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. Today's podcast is available on our website at www.sei.cmu.edu slash podcast. My name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher here at the SEI, and I'm honored to introduce to you to Nancy Mead, who is one of our SEI fellows. And this is the first in our podcast series featuring interviews with our fellows. We have seven of them, and Nancy is our first. So uh, welcome, wow. Nancy. I'm very, very pleased to have you here. And in these uh, podcasts, we're going to be talking a little bit more about Nancy's professional career, her background, than we are in, about any particular uh, research topic that we would like we would in, in our other podcasts. So the SEI fellows are people from whom the SEI leadership may expect valuable advice for continued success in the Institute's mission. And they've been so named because of their contributions to the SEI. And Nancy is one, you'll learn some of her contributions to the SEI as we go on. But she's been here for probably more years than she wants to tell us. That's right. And, but we won't, we won't go into that. Um, but you had a career before the SEI. Yes. And uh, before, we, before the SEI, uh, she was at IBM for many years. She is also uh, an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the software engineering program. So she's not, she, we share her with the university gladly so that she can continue in her mission as, an, as a teacher, which is one of the themes of your career that um, I've noticed and that we've taken, uh, taken, I guess, quite advantage of at the SEI over time. So why don't we start uh, talking about your early days? So you started at IBM. Federal systems, and you were developing and managing large real-time systems mm -hmm. in that ar arena. And this was in the early 60s. So this was not uh, today where anybody comes into software engineering. There was no software engineering then. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about what that was like, and especially about some of the gender barriers that you encountered and had to deal with when this was really about the math and not so, mu not so much about the engineering as we have today. Great. Well, Susie, it's great to be here with you. I always enjoy the opportunity to talk to you, and this is certainly uh, a great opportunity. Thanks. So um, let's go back. When I was in high school, I used to get a lot of telephone calls from my classmates asking for help, especially with math. And um, my mother kind of objected to this. She said, you know, they're just calling to find out answers. And it's, it's a one-way street. What she didn't realize was that by virtue of helping them, it helped me to learn. Mm -hmm. And in fact, was one of my earlier experiences that led into my interest in education. That, okay. That's been uh, a long time interest, as, as we'll see. Uh, the other thing about it is it caused me to realize that I was really good at math. And hence, I decided that that would be my college major. I knew that okay. when I was still in high school. Uh, when I got to college at NYU, uh, the campus that I attended was primarily uh, an engineering and arts campus, mm -hmm. a smaller one. And the year that I started was the first year that they admitted girls. And so there were three women in my class wow. who were math majors. There were about 100 girls out of maybe 3,000 students. So we were a very tiny minority. And there were three of us that were math majors. So very early on, we became used to the idea that we would be working in a field mm -hmm. with men. So that became comfortable for us. OK. When I finished and then went on for my master's degree, I started to look for a job because by then I was uh, completely out of money and had to work. There was no thought of getting a PhD at that, at that point in time. So the first month or so, I looked at the ads in the New York Times, which was the place mm -hmm. to find a job in the New York area. The first month or so, I wasted by looking in the help wanted female section, because at that mm. point in time, <laughs> <laughs> it was split up into help wanted male and female. Okay. 
Uh, and I quickly realized that there were no jobs for mathematicians in the help wanted female section. So then I switched and started looking in the help wanted male section. Okay. And the jobs ranged from actuarial intro positions, statisticians, okay. some in library science, and then programmer. Well, as a math major at that time, there was no exposure whatsoever to programming. So that was an unknown to me, but some of my classmates said, it's, it's a great field, you should get into it. So um, that happened. And uh, eventually I found my way to uh, IBM, IBM, as you mentioned, where uh, I enjoyed a long career. In the, in the beginning, most of the managers at IBM were promoted from marketing positions because marketing was the big thing. They were selling computers. Okay. And most of the marketeers were men. So uh, virtually all of the management team was men and there were some women in the software development ranks, and that was kind of a mix of, okay. of women and men. Eventually, uh, I was recommended for a management position, and interestingly, I didn't find overt gender barriers, but I would get kind of side comments mm. uh, from people saying, well, you know, you only got that job because you were a woman. Uh, and, and so there was that kind of atmosphere yeah. that was um, not very pleasant, and it was kind of as if you had to prove yourself, sure. prove that you actually knew something and you weren't just a token. For you, I don't expect that that was really very difficult. Um, no, it wasn't, because I have always been pretty forthright, and uh, once I found myself in a leadership position, it was, it was very natural for me. Years later, when I left management for a technical role, uh, one of my friends said, well, she may not always be a manager, but she'll always be a boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have our strengths. So. And our weaknesses. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe it was both. Well, sometimes it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Now, even today, uh, the number of women working in high-tech software and hardware, it's still pretty low. Um, some recent studies, indicate women only comprise 16% of software workforce. I was really surprised at how low that number was, and 9% for hardware. So what do we need to do to get more women involved as software engineers? I saw some interesting studies recently at the uh, Conference on Software Engineering Education mm -hmm. and Training, which I've been involved in for quite a long time. And um, one of the studies indicated that when people went into public schools, um, primary and high schools, to work with students, they would run software camps and sure. software events. Um, what they found was that girls that were, oh, in grammar school, maybe up until middle school, were very involved and very interested. And then it started to decline in terms of their involvement, so that by the time they reached the junior and senior year in high mm -hmm. school, the numbers were much lower. Were there any indications of what the potential were? causes for that? Uh, unfortunately, the people who reported this information weren't collecting that kind of right. uh, data, so I don't really know. But I think it's, it's a pattern that needs to be reversed if we are to get more women right. involved because it has to start very early. You can't decide when you're in a senior in high school that you want to study computer science in college if you haven't yeah. had all the prep that That's right. comes before. And there's much more today. I mean, you know, you do calculus much earlier than you did, you know, For sure. in our day and and you've got to have all the grades and everything. So if you're not prepared all along the way, you're right, you're going to have a hard time getting into the best universities and and you know, being able to pursue that. That um, I like the idea of, you know, the sort of software engineer, the, the software camps and things like that. I wonder if we can we do some things with STEM here at the SEI. Maybe right. that's something that we can do a little later. And I'm starting to get inquiries about that. 
um, I, I'm working with some people at the community college level, mm -hmm. but I haven't personally done any work at the high school high level school. or uh, below. And it's definitely a different ball game because of the requirements that you have to meet in order to even step into the classroom. Oh, I see. Okay, so, so that's something we'll have to figure out as we go exactly. along. Exactly. All right. Well, I, I, I know that if you start putting your mind to this one, that this problem, that uh, it will get solved like many other th others that you've solved over the years. So uh, we talked about um, your interest in being a teacher from a young, young age. And uh, you were, y y this didn't stop. I mean, you were a teacher in your earliest days. You did, I'm sure you did some teaching as part of your management. What are some of the big things in the teaching field and education field that you've been involved with either before or uh, since you came to the SEI? Well, um, I mentioned that I, I like to informally teach people and even um, in high school, my very first teach, formal teaching job was tutoring one of my classmates oh. who wanted to go to college but was struggling with the academic mm -hmm. math requirements. And uh, so that caused me to be interested in it. And then at IBM, I was manager of an education team that taught software mm -hmm. engineering and um, continued to teach at universities part-time here and there when the opportunity presented itself. And the, the federal <coughs> uh, systems, the, the kinds of courses mm -hmm. that you developed at IBM, um, I know in that time frame, getting engineering education at a company, I got lots of engineering education at Lockheed. You were providing the same kind of thing. What was the reason that big companies were so interested in providing their own engineering education in that time frame? I think there were several reasons. One is that it was not being provided at universities. Um, two is that, as you know, Employees were with a company for a long time. Yeah. A company like IBM would have employees who were there for their entire career. So employee development was, was really important. Yep. Uh, in, in the time frame when I was doing it, one of the big initiatives had been started by Harlan Mills, yes. who is, uh, or was one of the shining lights in software engineering. He convinced our division president that every programmer in the division should have background, formal background, in software engineering education, and, and that's how it that's started. How, okay. Later it transitioned to IBM corporate headquarters, and uh, in fact, some of the folks who had been here at the SEI were mm -hmm. on that staff, and I knew them uh, before I joined the SEI. When I joined the SEI, I was in the education program, which I later uh, became director of yes, and worked with campus on the Master of Software Engineering curriculum as it was instantiated here. And that was one of the first uh, degree granting software engineering curricula in the United States, if not the world, I'm not sure. It wasn't actually the first. Wang Institute, I believe, may have right. been the first. And but it was in the first three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was very early. It was definitely. Yeah very early and went on to inspire somewhere between 70 to 100 degree programs yeah. in just a few years. I don't have current statistics on, on where that went, um, but it, it was definitely a big impact. And that was partly because you not only developed the program, but you actually published the curriculum so that it would be available for other universities. So this was actually a, a formal outreach to try and, and instigate these kinds of curricula in other universities. So it wasn't just Carnegie Mellon trying to keep it to themselves. You were really trying to get this out there, and that was very successful. That the, the curriculum was published, and also that was the time that the Conference on Software Engineering Education mm -hmm. was started. And part of the purpose of that conference was to engage faculty to uh, be able to teach right. software engineering. Recently, uh, Grace Lewis, as uh, an initiative to bring in software engineering faculty for a few days in the summer oh. for a workshop, which is very interesting. That will be this year in August, okay. I believe. 
and uh, the Conference on Software Engineering Education and Training, of course, is still going on. And there are 20 plus years. Yes, yes. So that's that was. I think the next one is the 30th. Oh, is it really? In 2017. Okay, I knew it was more than 20 years, but I didn't know it had gone back that far. We skipped one year because we were refactoring the conference, if you will. Sure. Uh, and it came back um, with quite a good success. Lately, it's it's kind of been like many conferences. It, it, it just continues. Yep. And, it, and the... the uh, Attendance goes up and down, but the, the themes retain their importance because we, we have more need uh, for software engineers than we ever have before. And, you know, this is getting engineers that are trained for the engineering, not just for the programming. I think it's one of the differentiators of that conference is understanding that programming alone is not sufficient to be a member of a professional team in building, you know, uh, safety critical uh, human critical kinds of systems that many of the software engineers are asked to do. One of the changes that we've seen recently is the introduction introduction of the software assurance curriculum. Okay. Uh, that was an activity that I led and we've tried to transition that via the CSEET and also some other education sure. conferences that are related to cybersecurity. Right. Yeah, and that, that theme is one that we will it's not going to go away uh, anytime no. soon, not in our lifetimes, that's for sure. So uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, what you get to do when you're an SEI fellow. So one of the, the, the advantages of the SEI fellow is you're given a grant. And mm -hmm. uh, unlike some of our other processes where you have to sort of compete for funds to get to do the research that you want to do, you get to pick whatever you want to do. So tell us a little bit about what you've done with your grant and, and sort of what kinds of things have excited you enough to, to put some of your effort into. Sure. I should point out that the, the grant is a recent innovation. Some of the fellows that you will talk to who became fellows earlier didn't get the grant, and they're a little bit jealous of that. Well, um, we'll get to that when we get to them, but you got one. I'm sure. <laughs> Yes, I did uh, get a grant. It was for two years, and uh, it was for about a third of my work. Okay. Uh, and it allowed me to work on several things. Uh, the first was transition of the software assurance curriculum. Okay. Which is continuing. We have had uh, incorporation of the materials into curriculum at the Air Force Academy. As, oh, my. As well as five or six other universities, including Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had um, incorporation of the material at the community college level, and there's a pretty successful effort involving Illinois Central College, which is now offering a two-year program okay. in software security programming. In fact, they advertised the program and immediately got 20 students to sign up Wow! without doing any extra work, so it, it's pretty exciting, and it's a model that we may be able to implement nationwide, remains okay. to, be, to be seen. So that's one piece of the work, is transitioning the curriculum. Uh, another piece, and we're close to finishing, I'm writing a book with Carol Woody as co-author. It's called Cybersecurity Engineering in the Addison Wesley SEI series. Excellent. Right now it's in edit with the publisher, but it's already announced on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and do a search on my name, the new book will pop up. Oh, that that takes a lot. I've written a book myself. I know how much work it is. You've written other books as well. So this is significant work. Yes, and people thought I was crazy to do it again. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, one of the editors uh, at Addison Wesley said to me one time, he says, some people only have one book in them and then they're done. Other people have lots of books that they need to get out of their system. I think you're probably more one of the latter. I, I enjoy talking about it, but actually doing the writing is very painful it's, for me. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> well, Carol's got a very good partner, though. I, yes. Like you, I had a partner when I, when I wrote my book, and it was really, really, Rich Turner was my co-author, and I couldn't have done it without the co-authors, so sometimes we have to find ways to 
to you know get those things get those things through. Well, with Carol, so. it was you, you're right. It was very easy to work with her. Yeah. Uh, going through the edit and review process and all the permissions and hoops we have to jump it's, through. Yeah, there's some pain um, there. Makes it a little more time consuming. And okay. That, and so you said there was a third thing. Uh, yes, I have a research project on how malware analysis can be used to help identify overlooked security requirements. Uh, we didn't talk yet about my work in security requirements. Back in uh, 2005, I was a PI on a research project right. and developed a security requirements method called Square. Yes. Uh, that's uh, available on our website. There's a lot of documentation, many reports, and uh, a tool that can be downloaded and used. The new work was uh, really novel in my view because typically people who do research in malware analysis are trying to identify patches okay. to uh, basically fix vulnerabilities sure. in software. But that work doesn't necessarily get fed back into the development process. Ah. And so somebody developing a new system might sit and brainstorm about what security requirements they need, but they don't necessarily know what successful attacks have already taken right. place. In a system that's similar. In a system that's similar. Okay. And so that was the problem we have okay. been tackling. And we've taken that to a point where once again, we've done some research, we have a, a tool. There's a lot more that needs to be done and we're having conversations with potential sponsors about how we might continue the work because, quite frankly, the fellow grant is almost finished, and so it doesn't last we need forever. To find a new funding source. That's right. But it gave you enough to do a proof of concept that this idea actually had some merit. So you actually have a better chance at competing for funds than you would have if you had just started from scratch. So absolutely, the the, the grant was has been useful in that in that oh, sense. Oh, for sure. So. And we've also found some uh, outside collaborators oh, good. that we may be working with to try to secure those funds. Collaboration is good. Yes, and definitely. And gives you different perspectives on things, so, so that, that, that is all goodness. So let's fast forward five years. Cybersecurity is still going to be an issue. Lots of other things are going to be issues in software. What are the big issues besides cybersecurity that you see in the software arena, and what should the SEI be doing about those? Besides cybersecurity, well, one of the big issues, although cybersecurity comes into play, a lot of other things do as well, is uh, what we call the Internet of Things. Yes. Um, the idea of wearable computers, wearable software. What if you have, uh, oh, I don't know, a fit band that captures information and, and transmits it. I don't have one. Uh, I don't either. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people say, oh, this is great. It's all being stored for me in the cloud somewhere. They, well, they don't usually say in the cloud, but somewhere. Uh, that is where it is. Yeah. But they haven't really thought about the consequences of mm -hmm. that. If you look at uh, the recent self-driving car, accidents yeah. that have taken place. Uh, people say, oh, it's great, the car, take, the car drives itself. Well, not quite. Yeah, I heard someone say that if all the cars were self-driving, we would actually have less risk than having a mix of self-driving and cars with humans because the algorithms, you know, the humans are completely unpredictable in terms of how they will react to different things. And the, the, the software has actually some greater level of predictability. I'm not sure that we'd s still be safe, per se, but it might be. Uh, but, and then getting, I, I just think about people uh, in my life that I know that would never give up their, uh, their control of the car to a, a computer. So we're gonna be in that situation of autonomous and non-autonomous right. vehicles for quite a while, I think. I don't know if we'll see it in my lifetime. Personally, I would welcome a self-driving car uh, if the bugs <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you if you have to sit there and, in effect, watch it all the time as if you were still driving, you're not. You're not reducing your stress. Yeah. yeah. 
So Internet of Things, I think uh, all of us agree, is a big one. And that sort of we went into autonomy as one of the other areas that uh, affects both Internet of Things and has its own set of, of issues. Um, what kinds of things do you think the SEI brings to the table to help address some of those issues? I think that a lot of our research projects are aimed at a, a number of areas that could be beneficial. Probably not all of them will pan out, but That's if the there nature are of research. a few big winners, yeah. then I think we're definitely ahead of the game. Uh, I hear people talking about oh, scenarios about robots and drones, and I say to myself, those ideas are really sophisticated and interesting, but there are much more fundamental things that could also be addressed mm -hmm. with information that we have on hand right now. If we would just get it into the field and get it implemented across the board, we would be so much better off. So getting transition of basic kinds of ideas is just as important as getting the more sophisticated right. ideas. And, that, and that's part of our mission as well, is not just to do the research, but to figure out how to transition it into the world that it's relevant to. So, yeah, we have challenges there. I, I think the SEI is really in a good position and a unique one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've really benefited from that. I've certainly enjoyed all of the work that I've done here from uh, education to technology uh, to seeing a published book, even if I may not enjoy all the writing quite <laughs> so much. And, and so it's, it's been a lot of fun. Well, you have, to be. you have been, uh, you know, one of the people I've always enjoyed. Anytime I got a chance to work with you, even in a small way, um, it's always been, been not just fun, but enlightening. You, you think beyond the obvious, I think is the way I would put it. And so that's very uh, useful because we can always get caught up in the obvious and not see some of the subtler paths. And I, I really applaud you for continuing to think about that. Oh, thank you. As, as you know, your career, you've, you've touched so many things, you have a lot of experience to bring in. And we're honored to have you as an SEI fellow. I think I can speak for everyone at the SEI when I say that. Um, and I, I am really glad that you took the time to talk to us today and give people some background that they probably didn't know. I certainly didn't know sort of where you started your teaching passion and, and uh, some of those other things. So uh, thank you very much for, for having this conversation with us. It's a pleasure, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you in particular, Susie. Well, thank you. I'm really glad that I got to do this one. All righty. Um, this podcast is available, as I said earlier, at www.sei.cmu.edu slash podcast. It's also available on the CMU iTunes U site. As always, thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, please uh, give us an e drop us an email at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you so much for viewing.